again welcome everybody for this session. We have four papers uh, uh, to be presented today, and these papers were selected based on uh, discussions and evaluation which were made in uh, the first uh, uh, conference on um, geophysics for mineral exploration, which we held in Barcelona in the fall of 2016. And the first paper will start uh, by Dr. Uh, Malikmir uh, discussing application of seismic data for exploration and mine planning. Uh, then there will be talk by uh, uh, Tont Q from Australia about integration of borehole and seismic data with some interludic inversion. Uh, then I will give a talk about interpretation of airborne data, and we will conclude the session with integrated modeling of geophysical and petrophysical data uh, in northern Sweden by Dr. Bastani and others, his colleagues. And I would uh, ask uh, Vicky to introduce the first speaker, please. First up is Dr. Alreza Melmer, and he is currently the Professor of Applied Geophysics at Uppsala University. He mainly conducts research in hard rock with hard rock seismic data and deep targeting mineral deposits using seismic methods. He is the project leader of a wide range of innovative and cost-effective mineral exploration projects including the upcoming Europe-wide smart exploration involving 27 partners from 11 East, uh, EU countries. Please welcome Dr. Malahir. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thanks, uh, 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 Mickey, for introducing, introducing me. So it's good to see some people here. Uh, uh, it's, I guess you would not lose so much because I guess there are some talks on, on seismic running parallel, and I'm pretty sure there's, there's talk about Kavitsa in those talks too. So I will be advoca advocating why seismic data are an asset for not only uh, mine planning or maybe not only for mineral exploration, but mine planning, vice versa. Uh, before I st and I use Kavisa as, 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 as a case study to support my statement. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank my co-authors, uh, particularly Ari Trikvesen, who, who conducted the first break travel time tomography that is complementing uh, uh, some of the, 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 the work that we have done. And if you remember, I don't know if you were attending PDAC 2013, I was, I was presenting this, uh, preliminary results, and I, of course, was presenting this during glass uh, near surface geophysics in Barcelona. And, and that's, I guess, why I'm here. So I would like to acknowledge partners who contributed to, to data results, supporting uh, information, interpretation, particularly first quantum at the time that we, we, we got the data, we collected data. And, 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 and as, I guess, since 2015, late 15, Bulidin owns Kvitsa. So Kvitsa is a disseminated uh, nickel copper PGE deposit, or ore really, because it currently it's being mined, uh, hosted by um, a massive, this is a gray, gray rock you, you see here, mafic, ultramafic rocks called Kvitsa intrusion. So this is the current plan for the final stage of the pit. And a 3D seismic survey was justified following uh, a number of 2D, 2D, 2D surveys that showed the crust was very reflective, essentially maybe a potential that seismic could be used for structural mapping, also targeting where possibly mineralization uh, uh, is sitting in, in, the, in, in the intrusion. So the, the size of the 3D uh, survey area is about nine square kilometer, and that's the main focus of this, this, this presentation. Uh, just look at the schematic, how things look like. Uh, well, how do I go back here? So this is a schematic section showing down to uh, a kilometer. So this is elevation. And that's a Kavitsa intrusion. Uh, assuming when we started the, the, the study that it's a single massive intrusion, but you will see it wasn't. Uh, 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 rich in, in disseminated mineralization, sulfide mainly, but 
At some places, a massive sulfide mineralization was observed by a few boreholes. So this would be called, if it's within the intrusion, it would be called false, false mineralization. And if it's at the contact, it will be uh, called contact, contact mineralization. And of course, these were the main targets for, uh, 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 for the 3D survey too. So when we were processing the data, I'm not sure how, how much familiar uh, you are with seismic data. Essentially, one of the key steps is to correct for statics, removing the overburden thickness and, and velocity. We, rea we realized that uh, this would be the velocity uh, uh, um, that was used to correct for static. We, we, we realized a very big, very large velocity here was required for, for the intrusion. And that was not a surprise because it's, it's an ultramafic rock. And this is what defines, if you know, uh, a crust from mantle. So this is the rocks exposed now here. So we're talking about 7,000, 7,500 meter per second velocity background. And I will talk a little bit about the, the trouble with that kind of background. And when we saw that, and, and we realized that there were zones that had lower velocity, we thought, okay, maybe the first breaks that are used for, for refraction static correction, that's in, in the reflection imaging, could also be used for, for delineating the structures. Just quickly, if you look at how things look like, so this would be, again, the, the Kivitsa intrusion uh, 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 surrounded by volcanic sedimentary rocks. So we, we could see actually zones that they, they zones that essentially had uh, low velocity um, in there. And that would be where the, the final pit will, 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 will be seated. So this is, this is showing you all the sonic data we have from 11 or 12 deep boreholes. And what you see here is velocity in the Kevisa intrusion it, it's above 7,000 meter per second. It's pretty consistent what we got from the seismic data, surface seismic data. Just to see how we use this first break, we use them for reflection imaging, but you could use them for, for, for delineating weakness zones. So we go back and forth into this. So this is two receivers lines, two receiving lines from 11 that we had, or actually nine, showing first break undulations that you need to crack. And maybe evidence of something it's in, in these short records. So if you do a little bit of clean up, you start seeing reflections, beautiful reflections corrected with the statics. And with no doubt that one of the key processing steps of hard rock data is actually static. It's, it has remained static. And as we want to get good image, we have to deal with, with the statics. Uh, so another section just showing how the processing works. So this would be what we call typically NMO stack. So it's a time section. It looks pretty reflective. If you do a little bit of clean up, you actually start seeing beautiful reflectivity. So much of reflectivity in just one inline that you start questioning, was this supposed to be just Kevitz a massive intrusion? Not. So we started thinking like, what are we seeing here in, uh, in the Kevitz intrusion? So what you're seeing here is the base of the intrusion is here. And then everything else here, it's, it's, it's layering magmatic pulses coming into intrusion, and every pulse contains some mineralization base of it particularly. And this particular reflection is very, very important because we lost it during the processing. At least we lost part of it at the shallow part, and you could see later on that it was a key, key reflection. It's, it's something to do with the, with, the, um, uh, with the mine planning. So just looking at a, a few depth slices, so again, uh, plan uh, uh, final slice, uh, stage of the plan pit, that would go down to 600 meter in two, 20 years. So very clear reflector, this would be your country country rocks coming in. So as, as, as I move on to different depths, you can see that reflector is dipping to the west and, and the country rocks are coming to, to the south and, 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 and west. So this target was associated with, with uh, 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 EM anomaly, so it was a conductor. It was reflective, and, and it came at the edge of the, the, the intrusion, essentially one of those contact mineralization, and it was decided to be drilled. And I will show this a little bit later. This one, the, the reflection that I just showed you, it came at the margin of the, the pit, and we had no clue whether this had anything with, with the mine stability or mine planning at the time. So what you see here, the, 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 the reflector is at 100, is at 200 meter depth. This is a bit confusing. So it's about 200 meter depth. So average elevation is 200. So you're looking at 200 meter depth. 
So we could not see that reflector shallower, that shallower than 200 meter depth. And so therefore we could not say whether it was important for mine planning or not. So I'll go through this again. So that, that reflector was, was, was drilled. Um, I will come back to this later. So just looking at how things look, it's so reflective that we didn't know are these the structures or the lithological context. So what, what instead we tried to do, we look at some independent data set like VSP we had from the area and look at places like this that we had some movement in the reflectivity essentially was not continuous like this one, for example. And these were very consistent from one inline to another. So you actually you could follow them. And if I just put up a few, few surfaces that came from VSP, essentially these would be reflectors that are steeper. You cannot maybe see them with surface seismic, but you could image them with, with VSP. You can see that some of them actually come nicely within these zones that I, that I was talking. So let's move on. So we use that approach to pick places where we have this continuity in the, ref in, in the reflectivity as, as to represent vertical structure or steep structures. So we went on, at best we could present this. So near vertical structures, some of them going down to maybe uh, um, starting around like 400 meter depth, but nothing coming close to the surface. So we really did not contribute at that time so much in, for mine planning. So that's a reflector that was drilled. Uh, it, you can see it's, a, it's, it's two reflectors, for example, here. And it was conductive. And at the base of each reflector, there was enhanced sulfide mineralization. It was not massive, but there was mineralization. And it was not a key discovery. So one interesting thing came out. It was the base of the intrusion was nicely picked. We could see it in, in, in the seismic data. You can see one, one side is open. If you're familiar with the Sakati, this is Anglo discovery in Europe. Uh, lots of news came out of it. So that would be Kivitsa, that would be Sakati, and the open, uh, the, the base of the intrusion is actually open towards Sakati. So you could uh, speculate that there must have been a route somewhere, maybe halfway, maybe somewhere else, we don't know this, but maybe a connection between Sakati and, and Kivitsa where you could actually start chasing for those massive sulfide uh, uh, base hole mineralization or base uh, contact mineralizations. So just advocate how, how valuable are 3D seismic data. I am going to present this comparison with 2D and 3D data from Kevitsa. It's an article came from First Break. I think I saw it at the AG booth. You could go have a look at it, where we compare how valuable are 2D, 3D data compared to, to 2D with one case from Kevitsa. So this is a 2D data that I was, I was presenting. The whole cross is, is, is reflective. Essentially, you're picking lots of reflectors from the site, which you have no control. So that's a plan pit. Let's focus on that reflector. It seems to be a single reflector. If you look at a slice from a 3D cube, you see very high definition of that, that structure. It's not a single, single event or single feature. It has a proper thickness and a proper geometry, which you could actually understand. And this is a donite unit, and it's, it's associated with mineralization. We don't know how things work when the whole thing's in place. Um, a, a, another view, so it's a single reflector on one side, but in 3D, you actually see it very nicely. And in terms of resolution, there's a borehole going through this, this unit. It's a donite. It's 100 meter thick. So at 1,000 meter, we have 100 meter vertical resolution, and it's pretty impressive, I must say. Um, so. That reflector I was showing you, we could not track it into the pit, but we found something interesting. We called it R8 reflector, as this one. These are layering within the intrusion. The main economic mineralization is sitting in the foot wall of that reflector. So we've been uh, speculating if that structure is anything to do with the mineralization, maybe it's formation or distribution, we don't know it yet. We could not say that it was coming to the surface. So we decided to look at the first arrivals again and see whether we could improve uh, uh, structure, the shallow part, and we could link it to the reflection data. So here we go, two and a half million first breaks were inverted using travel time tomography this time, not layer based. That's a typical approach you use for static corrections. And we're gonna look how things look like. So before I show the result, when the mining started, Overburden was removed, and, and bedrock topography was surveyed very accurately. So what you're looking here is a bedrock surface. Plant pit has been exaggerated a bit. 
and you can see beautiful liniments going in, in two directions. This is the traditional velocity we got for, for refraction static correction. Uh, a fracture system that I will be calling later was observed when the mining started. And now we'll see how now you can link that R8 reflector to, to the rest of the, the data we got. So again, back to the, to the, the, to the bedrock morphology from um, the time they removed the overburden. You're looking at a reflection section at 300 meters down. So this one would be on the surface. This one would be 300 meters down. And that's a reflector we were talking. So that's a reflector we're talking. It's about 1,000 meter. Uh, uh, it has a lateral extent of about 1,000 meter, a kilometer, and goes down to 600 meter. Is these two the same thing? It's, it's something we will discuss. So that's a fracture model. Uh, two sets of them that are intersecting each other. Now you see them in the pit. And we're going to argue they're the same thing. So this is the travel time tomography. Now we beautifully see the, 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 the liniment, the low velocity liniment. And we can be pretty sure the same fracture system we were seeing in the reflect, or the same structure we see in the, in the reflection data, you can connect them now to the surface. Let's move on a bit. We thought maybe there is a footprint of overburden on, on the tomograms. So we removed the, that footprint from the data and we'll let the residual to invert uh, through a little bit of uh, uh, a time consuming process. So back to the tomogram again. So this is what you saw, traditional way of doing travel time tomography. And that would be how you remove that overburden, and this time you enhance feature in the bedrock. So the fracture system is now very clear. It has its own clarity. And we, this time we even managed to see this one. Not only that, I have a not good vision here, we could actually see one also here. And this one, these ones we also know what's happening here, so we don't need to be worried about it. So there are two nice low velocity liniments cutting the, 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 the the open pit, the plan open pit. So how does it look? This is our IR8 reflector. It's a fracture system. We don't see any movement, so we don't know if it's a fault or it's just a fracture system. It's pretty interesting. If you go a little bit back, so this is how it looks like, 5 to 25 meter in thickness in, in, in various places. We thought we lost it, but could we gain it back again from reflection data? So this time we picked that point where this should come to the surface, and we went to the, to the cube. We put that point on the, on, the, on, the, on the 3D volume, seismic volume, so it would come over there. So that's your surface from the surf, uh, bedrock morphology, you could say. And this is your, your R8 reflector. So if I show another view, this is it. So this model, you see a tail of a surface, is actually R8 reflector, or R, R8 structure. And you can see it goes into continuation of this reflector. So we have no doubt now the R8 is a major fracture system intersecting the, 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 of the pit. So if you exaggerate the whole thing, like quite a bit, so this is R8 reflector, is a major fracture system, it's cutting the pit, it goes down to 600 meter depth, and would it make trouble? We asked Bulletin if they could provide us some information, nothing came. Googling, Kavitsa photo, open pit, this is, okay. I will come back to this. I found some images before I show it. Let's look at our QD model. So this is the velocity again. I go back and forth. So this is our QD model. This is the velocity model. And you can clearly see the, the R8 reflector, some of these ones too in, 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 in both data sets. Sorry for this. But the clarity of the tomogram is much superior. Mainly because you're using old boreholes and you don't have control. You do this weight, um, uh, um, this distance weighting for, for the greeting. Is it a troublemaker? I googled and found this image. The very first thing I, I realized, it was of course this one. Is this my RA reflector and the other liniment? Yes, it was. You could actually put your hand into it. So if you would just zoom in, these are the two sets. Amazingly, this seems to be more major, but this is not reflective. Maybe it doesn't continue to do towards that, but this is the one that we call R8 reflector. So it forms a very beautiful wedge, and it's likely going to produce some problem. It's almost over. So just to conclude, I think with this case study, you can actually see the potential of a 3D seismic data, and it should be acquired before you start mining. 
because then you could use it for mind planning and you know revisit them and see what part of the data has what kind of potential for, for, for your purposes. Very beautiful correlation with, with RQD model. We, we have an article in Geophysics back in 2012 where we argued that, okay, we interpreted structures at that time and said, okay, as the mine progress in, in mining, you can actually see what we were interpreting. Even like you will be mining my, my reflectors or reflectors there. And that's actually something we should watch. So thank you very much. <laughs>